So thank you all for invitation. And my name is Feng Han Dai. I'm a postdoc working at uh, UMass Amherst and uh, MIT. And uh, uh, the previous talk is really interesting, exciting, and uh, I guess like uh, my talk will focus on uh, what I would say a higher layer. And in in terms of layer, you think about like the OSI model, like the um um uh the you can view like quantum network have a lot of layers and uh, there are physical layers and there are more like the, uh, the network layer. And this one is more like a higher layer that you don't deal with like a uh, very details of physics. You consider more abstract models and you consider uh, an operation like routing or like in some swapping in this network to see whether we have some insight to improve the performance. So the titles in time swapping protocols for quantum networks and the goal is actually just to distribute entanglement among nodes in this network. And uh, as we all know that entanglement is very important resource in, in quantum network, and, uh, but distributing it uh, along um, like uh, distributing the, like two nodes that are far apart is not so easy. And the reason is that you have this exponential decay. So suppose that you have two nodes that have like, they are far apart by a distance of L and the capacity to distribute entanglement, entanglement between these two nodes actually decays exponentially. This is the expression that you can show the L is in the exponent. So to overcome this issue, people come up with like, uh, people introduce the concept of one repeaters. So what you do is that between these two nodes, you insert a lot of repeaters and then you generate entanglement only between these two neighboring nodes. And then you do entanglement swapping. Entanglement swapping is sort of like teleportation, because basically you just perform bell-state measurement and send the result to neighboring node. Then you, by consuming two entanglement um, between two neighboring nodes, you can create an entanglement like that are far apart. So if you insert a lot of repeaters, and it will see that the capacity is changed from the this expression to this expression. So now you not only have the L, that is the distance between two nodes, but you also have the N, where N is in a number of channels, or like the uh, sub-channels, or say the uh, segments in this between these two N nodes. So you can imagine that if I insert a, a sufficient number of quantum repeaters, like N is large enough, then you can, this capacity does not rely on the distance anymore. So if L divided by 10 is constant, it's really the capacity is constant. So this exponential decay issue seems to be solved now. But this is ideal case. There are a caveat. The caveat is that the repeaters may not be perfect. And uh, if, let's say that, for example, like even in the previous talk, we, we mentioned that the Bell's measurement is sometimes it's a probabilistic, right? So if your entangle swapping is not successful um, all the time, then the benefit of using repeaters may vanish. So, and in that case, we may ask the question, um, should we design scheduling protocols for entangle swapping so that the amount of entanglement shared between the two end nodes can be maximized? So here is the toy example to show the scheduling protocols really, really matters for entangle swapping. So let's consider uh, a channel, the, uh, like a network, a repeater chains. It's actually a very simple quantum network that consists of like four channels. And uh, we consider a slotted time system. At each time slot, you are able to generate entanglement between two neighboring nodes with probability P. And you can do in time swapping at each node, but now in time swapping has success probability of Q. So with probability Q, you will have like a perfect in time swapping, but with one minus Q, you have nothing. After you consume these two entanglement, you, have, you end up with nothing. So let's consider two entanglement swapping protocols. The first one is what I call you do sequential in time swapping. So basically you do in time swapping at node one, and then node two, and then node three. So roughly speaking, if T is large enough, sufficiently large, then you can use like a lots of large numbers, numbers. And you will see that the entanglement you end up with is P times Q cubic T. That's the entanglement you will have between node zero and node four. But you can consider another entanglement swapping protocol. So what you do is that you perform entanglement swapping at node one three, and you, you have entanglement 
the p times q times t between zero and two and two and two and four. And then you do in time swapping and not two. So you will end up have in time swapping p times q squared times t. So you would, you already see the difference, the differences in the exponent that one is p cubic t, the other is p q squared t. So this difference shows that it's actually important to, to design protocols that are scheduled in terms of swapping that really matters in terms of rate. And this is just a toy example of like a repeater chain with four channels, but let's consider a more generic case. So what you have is that you have a quantum network and consisting of repeaters and cha channels, repeaters are just scattered and you have channels and channel have their parameters and you know those parameters. And also you have um, success swapping probability, but this probability may vary depending on which repeater it is. So these parameters also known a priori. And two nodes or two repeaters are source and the same. And again, we consider a slotted time system. So basically you think that uh, the, um, at each time slot, you can do two things. The first thing is that you can do in time generation between neighboring nodes provided that there, there's a quantum channel. So like here, if you have a, a node i and j with probability p i j that you will have an entanglement between this, you will, you will have entanglement between these two, two nodes at each time slot. And then you can do um, in time swapping at this, um, at this time slot. Uh, again, in the success probability for in time swapping is, is q, uh, q i depending on one, the, the node i. So what we want to do is that we want to maximize the amount of entanglement um, shared between S and T, distributed between S and T. So you will have a design, you have to design an entanglement swapping protocol such that, so this quantity here, uh, the number of phi S, uh, psi ST represents the amount of entanglement distributed between S and T in the first T time slots and divided by T shows that it's actually a rate and we let t goes to infinity. So this is the entanglement distribution rate between S and T. That's the goal, that's the performance. So how do we solve this problem? So this is a form well-formulated problem. It looks like a mathematical problem. And how do we solve it? And the way we solve it is that we consider a new graph that consisting of E nodes and E flows. So if you have a quantum network, like previous uh, just mentioned, you have a network and you design a protocol and then you can actually transform this quantum network plus protocol into a new graph. This new graph, you have E nodes that represent the qubit pairs in the quantum network. And also you have this E flows represents the rate of entanglement uh, exchange among E nodes. So this is very abstract and I'll show an example. So let's consider a very simple example that you have three nodes, I, K, and J, and you have two channels, I, K, and K, J, and the probability of the generating entanglement between these two neighboring nodes is actually P. So the protocol is very simple. For node K, you just do in time swapping whenever possible. So then you will consume this entanglement IK and KJ to create an entanglement shared between I and J. So for this simple example, the E nodes actually, uh, there are three E nodes represents the three node qubit pairs in this original quantum network, it's IK, KJ, an IG, so three nodes here. And the E flow, since you are consuming entanglement IK and KJ, you do in time swapping at K. So it, you consume entanglement IK and KJ to create IG. So the flow goes from IK and KJ to IG. That's because you use IK, use KJ and create IG. And the rate that you consume this entanglement is P because like, Whenever I can, I and K and K and J, when they're ready, they generate a, like an entanglement, you will do it in time swapping. So that's the rate of P. So with this uh, definition of E nodes and E flows, we can transform the previous entanglement distribution um, design problem into a optimization problem. So this is a theorem that we show that actually the optimal entanglement distribution rate is the optimal value for this optimization problem. So this optimization problem, you can see it has a lot of um, variables and notations, but you don't have to remember all of them, just to see this. So the idea is that the variables are E-flow related quantities. 
and the objective function will write it as a function of the E flow related quantity as well. And the constraints are just for different E nodes and the e, quant e flow quantities. And uh, the good thing is that these constraints and the objective function are actually linear in terms of like E flow related quantities. And it's not very hard to solve it because the complexity is actually poly, it's a polynomial function uh, with respect to the number of nodes in the original quantum network. And uh, actually with the solution of this optimization problem, we can really, if you, if you solve this optimization problem, you can use that solution to design a protocol that really achieves the optimal rate. So that's the idea. And here is the example like, um, of like an optimal solution corresponding to the previous shown toy example that you have four channels in a repeater chain. So this is actually Chris, uh, the second method that we propose. And this is indeed the best solution, uh, the best op uh, the, the optimal protocol that you will have. And this is a corresponding um, E nodes and E flows. So E nodes, actually there are three layers. The first layer corresponding to the neighboring channels, zero, one, one, two, two, three, three, four. The second layer corresponding to the internal swapping operation that it performed at node one and node three. And the last layer corresponding to the entanglement swapping protocol that they perform at node two. So you can imagine that if you have more channels, like uh, if it's a, the number of channels like it's power two, the depths of this sort of a binary tree is like a log of the total number of channels. And in this way, you can show that if n is like a power of two, or, or like for a generic n, you can sh uh, show that the entanglement distribution rate actually decays polynomially with respect to the total distance. It's polynomially, not exponentially. So even with this imperfect repeaters, um, we can still show that the entanglement distribution rate is not that bad. It still decays, it, but not really exponentially. So that's the idea here. And now we consider another setting. The, the setting is like, instead of a generic quantum network, we consider a special case of quantum network. It's called quantum switches. A quantum switch is actually a device, but it also corresponds to um, a special, um, like a starship quantum network. So the idea is that you have a quantum switch here, and you have n nodes, node one, two, three, and so on. Um, and you only have channels between the switch and the end nodes. You don't have channels among end nodes. And now we consider um, another uh, sort of like performance metric. So the idea is that you, you, you assume that their um, entanglement requests randomly arrive at the switch. So instead of maximizing some rate, you assume somebody is giving you some requests. Somebody gives you the, the, the tasks. Okay, you have to do generate this entanglement entanglement like uh, is like a uh, shared among n nodes. So this request have certain rates. So here, if you have three nodes, then the rates corresponding to one, two, one, three, and two, three. So one, two, two, three, one, one, two shows that this is a rate for entanglement between one, two. So again, instead of like uh, maximizing some rate, what we want to do now is that we want stability. Here stability means that you have a lot of requests at a switch, and you want to switch stable so that the number of unaddressed requests is, there are not too many unaddressed requests. Um, so what we want to do is that we want to make the switch stable and we want to characterize what's the impact of the rate, or request the rate of the stability. So we want to determine a capacity region. That region is that set of request rate vectors. So request rate vectors is this lambda one, two, lambda one, three, lambda two, three, this stuff. So in this special case, you want to have three nodes. So the rate vector uh, is three dimension. So the set of requests is now uh, uh, a space in this, it's a three D space. So um, we want to determine this region such that if you are outside of this region, if the rate vector is outside region, then there's no way that you can design any protocols that stabilize the system. But if you are inside this region, then people can, you have to provide a protocol that really stabilize, stabilize the, uh, the system. So that's the, the idea of capacity region. So for this quantum switch, if we consider a more gen, uh, general case that you have K plus one nodes where you have 
node zero is the switch and the K nodes are the, the end nodes. And you also consider started time. Um, so this is similar setting that you have entanglement generation between the node zero and the end nodes with probably PK that you successfully generate the entanglement and with probably Q that you successfully swap the entanglement. And this is a request that's a formal definition of the rate. And we can show that the capacity region, the region that we mentioned earlier, um, actually is given by this form. So this is uh, this FI um, with this given PG and Q. So this is the parameters of the system. You can use in these two equations to, uh, to use two equalities to really determine the capacity region, to really characterize uh, what kind of rate, um, with what kind of rate you can stabilize this uh, switch system. And of course, um, we have to design protocols if you are uh, within this uh, capacity region. We have uh, developed stationary protocols and on-demand protocols. Um, I won't talk about too many details here, but stationary protocols, roughly speaking, you don't care about the status of the system. You don't care about how many entanglements already generated and what's the number of requests, unfinished requests in the system. But on-demand protocols, you care about the system. Uh, you care about the current status, but you don't have to know any parameters. You don't have to know those PK or Q in the system. Um, okay, uh, I think my time's roughly there and uh, I need to wrap up here. So what we do here is that we consider a higher layer of uh, network design in, in quantum networks. And we develop the optimal entanglement distribution protocols for general networks. Uh, the key idea is that we, we need to introduce this E node and E float so that the origin problem can be transformed into a linear optimization problem. And for a special case like a quantum switch, we consider another metric, a stability, and uh, we determine the capacity region in terms of like, entanglement generation property and swapping property. So that's the conclusion. And uh, this work is, um, um, I, th these are the collaborators and the funding agencies for this work. Thank you. Thank you for the interesting talk. Um, I'll begin with the uh, organizer's question. What do you think will be the main use case of and the main challenge also for entanglement assisted communication networks? Um, the domain of entanglement assisting. So I think entanglement is a very important resources in, in communication. Of, of course, I know that there are some like uh, a theoretical work for the quantum capacity of entanglement assisted like the, the, the channels. I'm not sure if that's the case you're talking about, but I'm thinking in my mind, probably the future quantum uh, networks will be like you, you, you do entanglement generation as like one layer and the for quantum communication, you just uh, do teleportation. So in that way, the quantum communication just uh, becomes entanglement generation plus classical communication. So that's what I'm thinking for entanglement assisted communication. Uh, that, that's, Thank you. that's like okay. the, uh, yeah. And which possibility do you see for quantum technology to contribute to the success of 6G networks? I'm sorry, can you say the question again? I'm, I'm sorry, can, can you repeat the question? Okay. Uh, what possibility do you see for quantum technology in 6G networks? Ah, okay. Um, so I know a little bit about like the, uh, the 5G. For 6G, I'm, I'm not so sure like what's the, uh, the, the, the technical plan for 6G. But one thing that I, I can imagine is that at least this uh, cryptography or security part is very important now. And, and it's within the quantum information science, I think this part is relatively mature. I, I know that people are already building quantum networks or, or say QKD networks. So at least this part can contribute to 6G. The other um, uh, applications, quantum networks, I'm, I, I, I don't know. So I'm not so sure that they are mature enough for the 6G because I think 6G is, is sort of uh, imminent. So um, I'm not sure that the, uh, there's a sufficient time like for quantum networks to be mature enough to be ready to be used in 6G, but at least the QKD and cryptography part can be used directly. Okay, we'll have to leave further questions to the uh, panel. 
Uh, so let's thank uh, Wenan again. Thank you.